our languages of driving, expressed in terms of motion, posture of vehicles, as well as inclinations of the head and so forth that are noticed, as well as the official signals. These were studies that you were regulation. Oh, yes. Uh, a lot of work for that. A lot of work for the police in um, using things like that group decision system to um, train uh, detective inspectors. Uh, or at least to examine how the detective inspected in quite elaborate large-scale simulations over many days. This was a system called Simple, a project ran for five years, six years. Um, the um, In consumer marketing, this is where a guy who eventually uh, came in as a PhD to do his PhD after we had finished the work came from, on particularly the consumer, consumer studies of oil or on all sorts of things, but main focus is a gigantic simulation called, um, I forget what it was called now, it was consumer purchasing simulation for purchasing uh, gas central heating. Charlie, or, Charlie gas. It ended up the inverse was Charlie gas, the simulation itself was a very elaborate run, partly in the lab, partly in field sites, involving following the choice, giving advice, evidence from various sources to people who potentially wanted to purchase one sort or other of a central heating system uh, to see how they decided. It became quite obvious that decision was not a thing that was representable in some way with game theory or game theory modified into decision theory and so on. Only in very minimal cases could this be the case, and only in very few crude cases, which are characterized by a nice classification of payoff matrices or something. Um, it was pretty obvious that the usual notions of probability were falling apart, too. Um, and um, it's become more obvious even since that. And uh, this was a sort of transition period, this particular one, and uh, you're quite correct, Paul, in saying that the simulation was run in reverse as a salesman at an exhibition, a big, big exhibition place for Olympia, and beat the other salesman, Olio, in <laughs> far more commission. And uh, the only thing it wasn't allowed to do was actually to sign the contract, but they, uh, I mean, as a pretty very initial test of this thing, had reflecting in some way preferences of people according to the evidence they gave, the preferences they would have one way or another over a period. Uh, uh, I mean, these were not just laboratory studies and or just necessarily studies of actual Can you motor skill. The, how the simulation of Charlie Gas in more detail then? How it worked and what the, what the user experience was like. Or the detective one, whichever is most you know, well, using. Well, both, honestly, are quite interesting. The, the, the detective one was only one directional in terms of human piece. In other words, it was what finally ended up was a kind of um, program which somebody else wrote, and it's a very good program for simulating some good ways of getting information, or as it should be more properly called intelligence, um, in respect to criminal activities, and it consisted in, first of all, observing in the field, of course, obviously, and then bringing in DIs and their assistants, and keeping the laboratory for about uh, four or five days, and detective inspectors, to a certain grade in, in the UK police force, and it's equivalent to detective inspector here. I guess I had, what is the rank detective inspector the same? I recall it in the, uh, what is the detective, yeah, it's not, the, the detective sergeant is much less. The detective inspector is pretty high-ranking, but specialized individual concerned with crime, usually with a particular sort of crime, uh, or a particular neighborhood, or something of this kind. Mm -hmm. And uh, these were real ones. I mean, they weren't just people playing at being detective inspectors. And all the consumers, people playing at being consumers, they, they were there as subjects because in fact, this thing was informative. They were put into a situation, in the case of the DIs, where they could get various information. They had a crime scenario, several of them, and uh, went through several of them, in fact. And um, these were genuine crime scenarios. They were unknown characters. 
and they were super disguised, uh, didn't contain offensive words, words which would have given people away or something. There were a lot of things kept by DIs among the crook police community, which never get into the police, and don't get into other DIs either. They, they're deliberate and rather telling way in which they surround themselves, not by keeping it secret in the sense of any trivial sense, they actually obfuscate the boundaries of their core information by putting contradictory hypotheses all around of a kind which will be appreciated by their colleagues. You talk to me about individuality, I can tell you quite a lot about it in practice. And uh, this is how, in fact, these guys operate. And it's how they operate with a whole load of villains. There's a name for a crook. Uh, fairly large operator crook, usually, and uh, it's how, how in fact they, they work. Uh, and they fought to I think it's true in, in um, certain kinds of espionage as well, counter espionage. But it's, it's undoubtedly true in the, in the civilian police and uh, dealing with crimes of any magnitude, uh, from break ins to murders. And um, what, what happened simply they were presented with this stuff. They were, it, was, it, was all, it was done adaptively so that the load was actually compensated against them. Uh, the, the load of data they got or could get was compensated. The load of data they had to get from the scenario, which they would have got anyhow, was compensated. But they had access to, and one knew how much access they had to various data sources, which are things that come in every morning at a police station it was simulated, I think, every, well, every so often. It had to be, give a rough idea, be every two hours, probably, in the morning. But, I mean, this varied according to how far the guy had gone, and it was an adaptively very clamped experiment. Um, so, actually, was the... Uh, consumer simulation where people were given similar information, stated similar objectives uh, insofar as they could in respect to different central heating systems. Now, I normally don't believe in objectives in the sense of alternatives, excepting when they are manifestly announced. And um, it is possible to list the alternatives available to somebody uh, and to uh, because there are a finite number of installations available on the market, and uh, they involve particular difficulties and have particular advantages and so on. So I'm prepared to say here they, you know, there, there, there were alternatives, and this is sensible enough. If there, and there was a catch-all, obviously, they didn't buy anything. And they were, in fact, helped a great deal in this pursuit by being given information, which otherwise it would have taken them maybe a month or more to, to collect. They got it, in this case, within a, an afternoon or a day. Less than a day, actually. In you know, uh, about six hours. Uh, which was a great advantage and encouraged them, as you might expect, to exteriorize a lot of otherwise hidden mental events. How, how did all of that work? They were given the... the they were given things varied from slides to files to messages to samples of what they'd hear in a pub. Their edition was taken by by heating experts, okay. by uh, a variety of other sources of data which are looked at adverts. And then what... Uh, People who call themselves consultants. How they were required uh, to exteriorize? They exteriorized it by tracing out some likelihoods, and they exteriorized, which you tried initially to measure by probabilities, but it didn't work. The probability measure was no use. It turns out that the... the I'm just going to call them likelihood indices. And um, people can crank up and down likelihoods, and they do it in a very curious way of, of purchasing one thing or another. They also stated certain objectives. Sorry, what do you mean purchasing? Uh, uh, purchasing, buying. Meaning when people purchase things, they... They, they usually think about it first. In a central heating system is not... is nowadays... You, you're, you're familiar with the UK a little too late for this to make good sense, I guess, but in nowadays nearly every house has a, a central heating installation in it, or else every new house built is fitted with one. In those days, it was seldom found. It was seldom the case that you had central heating, so you had to install it in so an I, existing premise. No, but you say, what does it mean to purchase? No, 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 no. I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want to... 
want to get you back to this yet. I'm sorry. Uh, well, well, I thought you meant purchase in the sense of purchase information. What I'm trying no, to they, I'm they, trying they, they had explicit scenarios. To how there was a sense. There was indeed a sense in which they purchased information, but they didn't have to pay for it. They purchased it with trouble, with effort, and. Uh, it is perfectly possible to say, yes, there, there was a costing attached to information. It was not a monetary cost. Fine. How did that work for you? In it, sense, it, trouble. It, it uh, worked in the amount of search required, and the amount of search that would be done for them on behalf of things they already stated to be required. Mm -hmm. So that, in fact, select, selection was made on their behalf if they wanted it to be made. So this was done in the But they could always access it. Yeah. So there was a human? No, it was run by four human beings, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the computer. What sort of things did you? It was by four human beings in the computer. What were you seeing happening here in these? Oh, we were seeing people arriving at choice, often not to buy anything. Uh, they were seeing how they accepted and rejected various pieces of data which they received, which was very initial. Whether they were off-put by certain kinds of. A slogan, uh, certain kinds of alleged advantage, which may or may not have been genuine, how they found out whether the evidence they were given by the advertisements or by things like Design Center, which is meant to be pretty very initial, it usually is, how they checked out that, how they, they did that as compared right, exactly. to a, a brochure, which was available. But, but at, the, at the next level, how, uh, they, how they tried out the the sort of working model you could make of, 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 of house heating, which is very easy to do, in fact. It's very easy to compute what what is needed if you want certain temperature requirements, you have a certain sort of house, and certain weather conditions prevail, and so on. Whether you're anxious about fluctuation of oil price against gas price, electricity price, coke price, coal price. But at the next level up, in terms of uh, the behavior of subjects uh, in relation to learning situations, you must, th this is... Well, they were able always to talk. Um, invariably, they could talk, and everything they did was recorded on tape. Um, I didn't make video records of it. I didn't have any video equipment to do it with, actually. And um, anyhow, I don't think it added much. Um, they certainly left indices in the form of likelihoods, which are requested to do periodically. And they certainly selectively asked for advice. And they did that usually not verbally by a layout of keys and stuff, which was fairly transparent in the context of this particular purchasing. And it is context dependent, and uh, it makes sense to have buttons labeled design center or uh, regional design center or advisory board of the gas council or servo warm. Uh, in, in that context, because these words are commonly known, they're, they're advertised all over the joint. I'm, I'm trying to look for a, a more abstract description now of, uh, as in the uh, the first machines you were telling us about the emergence of a conception yeah. of lumpers and spinners. And yeah. so well, this, uh, we were getting somewhat similar kinds of picture here. Came into this because you said you were interested in consciousness. Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, I, I was giving a justification for my interest in consciousness. And this justification, like I was trying to support the fact that I hadn't done this simply in terms of a number of laboratory studies, nor a number of studies of what are often called perceptual motor skills, chiefly with a military application. Okay. But had also done it in the context of a number of real life situations, which, uh, which incidentally, is a real life component of most of these studies. Um, but um, a very realistic component of, of uh, predicting purchase requirements and so forth from the, 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 what in those days was the North Thames Gas Board. And, um, I'm pressing you because I think mm -hmm. th that's a good response. I, I'm beginning to think that having listened to the evolution of this that I, I understand now that a critical thing we need to talk about in pursuing all this discussion is is the range of questions. Mm -hmm. The choice by you as opposed to the experimental psychologists or the artificial intelligence people as to what it is you want to know. And no. the ways you want to know it as much as technology. So sure. Well, my first my first spec here and the reason I what I'm really justifying is that I said I want I want to be able to talk about consciousness. It seems to me that all of these phenomena 
whatever else they were, were certainly involving consciousness. And however much I might say about observed behaviors or something, it wouldn't have the slightest bearing upon the subject, light relevance to the subject. Some behaviors would be highly relevant, they're intended. But the behaviors, let us take driving as an example, another one I gave, uh, had I confined my notion of language and experience simply to a spoken language or something, and I'd never been able to talk about the linguistics of traffic or a, a concept which has proved very useful called space cushion, which is the effective boundary around a driver in an automobile, and uh, which depends obviously on some physical factors like road conditions, density of traffic, weather. Um, type of vehicle, braking possibilities, etc., but also upon a, a larger number of factors, both conceptual and tangible, mm-hmm. concrete, and um, some commonly observable, and a number of mores, like the traffic regulations and the highway code, and so on. And all of these determine what actually it means to drive and why there is a traffic problem. If you're addressing a traffic problem. Were you involved in that? Uh Famous study traffic in towns, or whatever it is, the, the Buchanan. I, you know the one I mean? Yeah, one I knew it? about it. I was involved in it only in direct to the Road Research Lab. Uh, Jeffrey Vickers quoted yeah. it a lot. Yeah. Uh, traffic in towns or something. Okay. Mm. So you were able to come up with a more... I was not directly involved, but necessarily this project got data from everywhere. Um, we got all the U.S. data ritually, and the, all the Scandinavian data ritually, as well as all the U.K. data. So this research had some, in, in the case of the traffic work, some practical effect in giving a better description of what the traffic problem was, yes. and presumably in, in, in solving it or ameliorating it? Well, uh, it gave a much better account. I, I, I not, don't say that everybody, anybody take much notice of it, uh-huh. but... Um, it certainly had some revealing consequences. I mean, what were a few of those? Well, a few of those are, for example, um, one of the indices used in this was uh, essentially conversational, and uh, this was in the conversation theory era, actually. And uh, they were a convenient method in this case was to use Ronnie Lang's IPM technique on somebody themselves. So one little bit of the study, and it is only a little bit, it is descriptive in a way, is to show people a film or just set of pictures even, which is quite enough, uh, from taken from their vehicle, which is called X, let us say, with a number of obstacles, including other vehicles perhaps moving, and another vehicle coming towards them, which is going to it's called Y and is going to be a hazardous machine. And so you could, for example, you have to choose whether or not to overtake a semi-stationary object or a slowly moving lorry truck. Okay. Typical situation. There may or may not be a T-junction in the neighborhood, and there may or may not be traffic in the T-junction in the neighborhood. Let's say that's a typical situation. You approach this, right? You are asked what you're going to do uh, to each point, and you're driving on an even course. Uh, some stage, they're either going to bang into the back of the thing, decelerate their own vehicle, or they're going to try to move out. Uh, otherwise, they will crash. Now, what point is this done? It depends, of course, upon how much they think they can signal to the other vehicle, how far they think the other vehicle is obeying the official regulations of the road, upon the road conditions, which in this case were held pretty much the same. Uh, it was fair weather, uh, good light. Uh, the um, same series has gone through quite often with different situations, but amongst the more repetitions of the same series, excepting that the guy in vehicle X, namely the subject, so-called, is now placed in vehicle Y, and is seen from vehicle Y's point of view. And you can now compare their people's reactions to these two situations, because when they do decide to do something, you ask them in each case, and what they think the other relevant vehicle, vehicle Y, will do, okay, the vehicle seen coming towards them rather than the vehicle they're driving in, uh, what they think the other guy will do, and what they think the other guy thinks, if anything, about what they'll do. And 
So taking these reverse pictures where the driver previously in X is placed very additionally in Y in precisely the same sequence, um, the vehicle not being identified as such, uh, you can compare these two together and get an IPM index, which is a very good one, it's a self-index against, um, instead of doing the IPM between a couple of people in a um, psychiatrist clinic, you're doing it on a driving situation about possible actions and their beliefs about another driver. And it uh, it's very interesting that, of course, the agreement of the drivers, the agreement between the two, may be very high indeed. They may agree as to what will happen very much. Typically, they will, in both situations, they uh, are habitually a slow driver and they believe that the traffic regulations will be kept. And somehow, people ought to keep these. Um, and boo to them if they don't. I get the insurance off of them. They're extraordinarily dangerous. If they understand what they think the other guy is going to do, much better. They have to be very good drivers. If they have no understanding whatsoever, they're a danger. Mm -hmm. And um, that is one result. Yes. And uh, you can, uh, this is a perfectly uh, easily to obtain the index. Mm -hmm. And you can now check it against their actual behavior on the rear. Part of the study we had them follow, too. Did you, when you were first doing the, uh, the precast studies and also mm. doing some of these uh, real world, as it were, mm. or non -la mm. laboratory studies, mm -hmm. did you fully understand at that point that? You were interested in a subject outside of the usual scope of contemporary psychology, consciousness, or whatever else you wanted to call it that you were looking for. Oh, oh yes, I mean, I, I, I you always to take contemporary psychology as a bit of a, I don't know, something which, fine, but um, didn't seem particularly satisfactory. Was there a point, what, what I'm looking for, I was thinking of this before we sat down today, was there a point at which you could have looked at your approach to science or what you were doing and said that was a, a sort of a starting point in which you were within the accustomed point of view where you might have been more at home with the uh, approach of these experimental psychologists or the current artificial intelligence. Well, frankly, I never was at home with it, but I respected it and still to some extent do in its right place. Uh, I think it has a very limited place. And um, it um, is so limited, it doesn't greatly interest me, but I have quite respect for it in its proper place. And uh, the, um, well, just so to the departure to... was not, as it were, a radical change in faith, as much as a conviction that for reasons other than my belief in the matter, it was necessary to, do, to, to adopt a different paradigm altogether. I mean, I was quite prepared to write papers of the sort in that journal. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, believe in them and take them with a pinch of salt, like all such papers, because I think I always thought they had limitations in common with others. Um, at a certain point arrived at which I felt that little could be said, something could be said, albeit, because I didn't particularly want to say it, within the restrictions of that sort of paradigm. And uh, therefore, instead of opting out and going to um, write songs or do something else of the kind I can do, I um, decided I would still continue with science, but that what is meant by science must be enlarged to, let us say, admit consciousness as uh, not necessarily something that could be explained, because I was not sure, and I am not at all sure, that the word explanation is properly applied. In this case, I don't think it's necessary to apply it to all science. Here I would differ with Bunke, insofar as he, uh, as you know, makes a distinction between, first of all, common knowledge and scientific knowledge. Uh, scientific knowledge being uh, acquired by particular methods. Next, he's prone, though not obsessively, he's prone to prefer 
minimally deviating hypotheses, uh, where I disagree. Um, I agree with the beauty of the method when it's applicable. Uh, uh, he makes another useful distinction, apart from common knowledge and scientific knowledge, um, uh, between science, um, rationalized technology, I think he calls it, and uh, pseudoscience, i.e. things which are not science, that pretend to be science. Uh, he's certainly anxious to avoid pseudoscience if it's blatant, and there were many of the things that Bungay would call pseudoscience, like, for example, psychoanalysis. I would not. Um, on the other hand, I feel that science has to deal with common knowledge, as well as scientific knowledge in, in Bungay's sense, and tend to prefer radical departures uh, rather than minor deviations. Uh, that is a matter of aesthetic, frankly, and uh, that's about all. I'm really only interested in, in, in large inventions. <laughs> um, and so I'm quite prepared to be called, for example, an inventor or um, a, a rational technologist or something. And uh, applied epistemology was a term used yesterday, some while ago, I don't know. It was yesterday. Um, and, uh, for example, I'm quite prepared to be called implied epistemologist. And I'm not at all sure of the cybernetics is, in everybody's view, science. I've written a couple of papers where I've expressed the view that quite possibly it is not. It is indeed, say, applied epistemology, or it is indeed, say, um, a technology, uh, but a rational one with theories in it. Um, Mungay wouldn't deny a, uh, I think, a perfectly rightly used phrase, I think he's quite right in introducing this distinction, a thing called general systems theory. Uh, which um, I once had the honor, or indeed the great honor, great honor, to be president of the Society, the Society for General Systems Research, and it's an excellent group. Uh, but the, I think it's misnamed by um, Bertolanffy, I think it was who named it. I think it's slightly misnamed this one, Bertolanffy, in the following sense that, as Bungay points out, it would better be called a general theory of systems. Now, this point of view is now coming around again. I mean, George Clare, for example, his emphasis upon uh, the comparison and contrast of the relations proper to different ontological domains is, um, in a sense, saying just this, too. So it's by no means an unusual approach. In many ways, I don't agree with George Clare about something that, but about that one I do tend to. And I would add, therefore, to the technology uh, to be uh, that cybernetics is to do with a, a general theory of systems, not a general systems theory. Um, and I, I mean, many general systems theorists would, I think, uh, take that point. So naturally, the position of cybernetics, which I take to be, you know, overlapping to such a degree that I don't think it's worth really bothering to distinguish very much between the four parts. Is um, is um, a, 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 either somebody calling themselves that or a cybernetician must, I think, um, entertain any doubts that are brought up as to the scientific status of the work. Uh, it just depends upon which philosopher of science you choose to go along with, uh, or if any. And um, I'm not at all ashamed of the criticism this is not science. Mm -hmm. I would be of the criticism this is pseudoscience, uh, on the other hand. Uh, it is not science, meaning that it is not in the strict, <laughs> in a certain strict set of canons, science. And yet, according to many other canons, it is. <laughs> so, what I mean when I want uh, to accommodate consciousness in science is qualified, of course, by, by this structure, to which, I, which I think applies to the whole of, of, uh, of general systems and cybernetics. Um, and one has to be alive to it and, uh, and quite sensitive to this matter and not to, uh, but, but to argue the case, by all means, if people claim um, that it isn't a science, but I think my own opinion is it is. But, uh, 
that I, I can appreciate is not agreed with by others, and some others, it is with by others, <laughs> some are not by others, and there's not something which I feel very strongly about. I do feel very strongly about its formalization. So whatever you call it, um, if for example you call it a, a rational technology, or applied epistemology, or something like that, uh, there should indeed be built up a formal scheme which would be a theory about theories of. And uh, that I do believe is important. That doesn't stamp it in all minds as being a science. Uh, it actually renders it in the domain of the philosophy of science. Uh, and it will appear in the philosophy of science either as a science or a collection of them with an auxiliary philosophical theory about the unification of these distinct theories. And precisely how it will appear is, is not bothering me too much. What I did demand is the paradigm in whatever structure it's erected is erected in such a way that it doesn't do what it seems to me that the standard paradigms do uh, universally, namely they exclude the major phenomena both in real affairs and in laboratory affairs, of consciousness from being addressed uh, and studied by whatever it is you call cybernetics. And uh, it is, in fact, I think, the prime, one of the prime research interests uh, for others of a comparable nature, which I could have included also, but which are not quite so easy, so poignant or so easy to capture. And um, you would cite various things like, for example, this business of large organizations and their interactions and their partial understanding by middle managers. This kind of thing I wouldn't want to exclude either. But uh, if you want a kind of definitive line, I think it's sensible to give a definitive line. That's the criterion. Uh, it's a well understood, well specified criteria. I generally agree, I think, that the moment science doesn't encompass consciousness, psychology and social science get very scared when they suggest they might do. Uh, they even try to regard it as an epiphenomenon. Um, the pure sciences are more honest in the matter and are better thought out philosophically on the whole. There are exceptions. I mean, uh, Taylor is a very deep thinker about the well, both tailors are one uh, wrote that paper of Dick's and also wrote um, an explanation of behavior and the other one who wrote a book on uh, essentially a reduction of view of perception in systemic terms using a lot of uh, Ross's work and did a very beautiful book but is not a terribly profound thinker at the philosophical level um, whereas uh, the um, other tailor, I forget what is R and the other is G or something, uh, is a, a very careful thinker indeed, and a very not only, not only a careful thinker but also a very profound philosopher. They're both careful thinkers, very good thinkers. But um, so there are exceptions, but I mean, a few and far between, and. Um, Never never occurred that, well, what is required? And one of the things that seemed to be required was, first of all, to study relevant interactions, because um, a model for consciousness, due again to Warren McCulloch, and insisted upon rather by Warren McCulloch, is the proper use of that term. <coughs> that A, designating a sentient being, is conscious with B, designating another sentient being, in a transaction, an interaction, which may not be spoken or verbal, but has the nature of a conversation. It could be this tennis or driving or whatever. And the persons could be, of course, I would want them to be. Uh, sorry, the, the the participants, sorry, would, would be A and B, would be. 
necessarily uh, in that case entities such that several could coexist in one person. Uh, maybe necessarily at least two would coexist in any person. Um, but probably a whole population, probably many. That on the other hand would be cases where they were shared between people. So the different brains accommodated different bits of the same participant and the interaction in question occurred between this cooperative entity and another such cooperative entity, say, or between the multitude of possibilities one can imagine. And um, it hence seemed necessary, first of all, to talk about what are the hard data uh, of such a thing, and I, I call the observables conversation, but in this very liberal sense, they all have this linguistic component, but it's not linguistic in the narrow sense of linguistics, usually. Um, and it is um, necessary to say what is hard data. Well, I don't mean the only data, I mean the hard data. If this has any pretenses to science who? That's a very interesting thing it's turned out. That uh, distinguish, for example, between a behavior or an observation of the traffic stream or something of this kind, which is, can be made, I guess, as precise as you would like it to be. Um, it is not, however, a hard valued hard-nosed psychological event. However precise it is, uh, it may be a hard-valued behavior, behavioral event, sure. Too. I mean, it can be made, as far as I know, in propitious circumstances, as accurate as you'd like. Uh, it may be a hard-valued uh, traffic event, or uh, event in, in media, or whatever it may be you're looking at. But it's not, by that token, a hard-valued psychological, social, or in this sense, cybernetic event, or cybernetics capable to accommodate consciousness, is not one of the hard data, uh, and so we need to identify that first. And I proceeded so to do. And it turns out that it isn't necessarily repeatable, so that criterion of hard uh, doesn't apply. It sounds a bit curious that hard-valued events are not necessarily repeatable, because um, generally speaking, you mean by a hard-valued data, something that can be repeated under what is called the same conditions. And one questions, therefore, your initial definition when you find that it can't always be repeated. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it turns out that, of course, there are never, in the first place, there are never the same condition. Um, but uh, the... Um, there can't be the same conditions in the relevant sense of the word as there can be by setting up temperature and, and pressure and so forth in the vessel uh, and mapping it against uh, a clock. Um, and the, that is one objection. The main objection is that what were the hard-valued events which could be not repeated necessarily but related one one to each other both looking at them on the inside and the outside, whichever. And that is important. In other words, that they could be recognized by those people aware of them, and they could also be observed by an instrument. Now, they couldn't necessarily be repeated. They might, you said mm -hmm. they had to be recognized. They would be put one one correspondence, yeah, but that is not the same. It's not a different criterion of repeatability. It doesn't mean to say that if the bell rings five occasions, it's a better, you know, it's a more, more certain bell or something. It, it might mean that uh, it's a different signal. Uh, the difficulty is, of course, that what's happening here is that for many of the events, and in particular those which can't be repeated by setting up similar conditions and doing the same thing, uh, are not so much unrepeatable as unsequenceable. 
So the appearance of not repeatability is in fact slightly spurious, um, providing you revise your notion of what temporal and causal sequence is. Um, now by this I do not mean making it sloppy, because to do so would be to destroy the validity of hard valued events, which turn out to be things called agreements. I tag them agreements over understandings and will explain what, what exactly they mean and how they can be recognized. Uh, but that when mapped onto a uh, topological structure of a clock, or else a, a line with knots in it, a string with knots in it, uh, tied to represent instants and uh, indefinitely long string, the length between which are called intervals, when mapped onto that topological structure by a projection, of the actual topological structure of the event, which is hard value, uh, may appear and reappear, as Heinzmann first noted many years ago, a self-organizing system could perfectly well be distributed over space and has the most curious appearance in time. Um, this uh, is true, literally. And I did, amongst other things, incidentally, want to bring in Heinz's original notions of self-organization, which we had worked together quite a lot. And um, the first requisite was to get these hard-valued events defined. I'd rather do that in a gout of doing it, rather than sort of do it chat-wise now. I think I'm prepared, well, I'm sure I'm prepared to say, I'm not sure that everybody's prepared to believe or agree, but. Uh, I would say they are agreements over understandings. Uh, they cannot be truth valued in a standard logic um, any more than a command can be or a question can be truth valued in a standard logic. Uh, they're not of propositional form. You can have propositions about them. So you could have a measuring apparatus which is set up uh, and such as to say that uh, it is true that, according to a standard logic, uh, a certain type of hard valued event and agreement over an understanding occurred. But the, um, this is a, a, a meta statement made in some, by some extended apparatus. And agreements, of course, very often come on and off. And typically, if you look at a conversation, you will find that the hard valued events appear to be distributed in all sorts of curious places. And their beginning comes before their, sorry, their end comes before their beginning. And this sort of thing is very, very odd if you try to sequence them in, 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 by a projection, which obviously loses not only information but structure, onto one symbol. And the plain fact is the dimensionality of the events called hard value, called agreements, is very variable and is often very large. Now, by this I do not mean the Euclidean dimension of them. I use the word dimensionality in deference to my good friend Ron Atkin um, and several others, uh, it's uh, possible to represent the sorts of order appropriate to counting, for example, over these hard valued events by topological structures, for example, relational structures, which may have great topological complexity. If you look uh, their relational composition and wish to look at the structure of this relation. And here I'm talking about an event relation, namely the, the hard-valued event. Uh, it will be possible to represent it algebraically in a Euclidean space of a certain dimension. And this is a piece of mathematics. And it does refer to the topological order of the structure in which the hard-valued event occurs, which may vary from event to event, is seldom uh, one, uh, as a Newtonian-type event would be, uh, so that in fact usually it's a reductio ad absurdum to ask for when did this company become successful or to use Ron's favorite one, when did you last fall in love? 
and try to be more and more accurate about this is a hard valued event and I'm sure it is a hard valued event uh, it's uh, amongst others it's quite a complex very very complex hard valued event a terribly significant important one but um, it, it, it becomes manifestly absurd on the inside though not on the outside of the thing as it were to question with greater value detail on which particular moment, which particular day, of which particular nano moment of that moment and so on is completely bonkers. Uh, and it becomes obvious that the meaning of the event has disappeared in this kind of attempt to obtain, quite for a reason that we all ought to obtain, uh, increasing specificity. Um, and uh, you don't. You obtain a, a ridiculous situation <laughs> which obviously doesn't refer to the event at all. It's equally absurd to say, what's the probability that you're going to fall in love, or what's the probability that this company is going to be successful? And when people say these things, they sound a bit zany to begin with. In my opinion, they're completely zany. Mm -hmm. uh, and I... Um